Good morning on this dark, rainy morning. Today, I want to talk to you about a biblical notion of leadership, and you thought I was going to talk about holiness, but I'll get there and show you the connection. Within the culture at large, the focus is often on leadership positions. Who is important? And in Christian circles, discussions about leadership often differentiates amongst spheres. Is it more holy to serve as a leader in a nonprofit or a ministry than a for-profit? A biblical notion of leadership uses an entirely different set of lenses. I've found this to be so typical of the Bible in that you're arguing between two positions and then you find the Bible turns it on its head, showing both choices to be looking in the wrong direction. The Bible ties leadership to spiritual maturity rather than to a sector or a role. And since all of us should strive for spiritual maturity, all of us should be preparing for leadership. As the scripture said, therefore an overseer must be above reproach, faithful to his wife or husband, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So the Bible turns the discussion inside out. It is not about the types of leadership roles that count as Christian and which ones don't, but about the holiness that all of us should seek, which in turn enables us to lead effectively. We are called to develop these characteristics in order to receive from God the power to do what we cannot do ourselves. And I want to say that again. We are called to develop these characteristics of holiness in order to receive from God the power to do what we cannot do on our own. A friend of mine, Scott Roden, former president of Eastern Seminary says, leadership is a journey from the inside out. God prepares his people to be leaders in his kingdom by changing their hearts, their attitudes, and their views of themselves first. Only as we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ can God use us to build his kingdom. And surely this is something we wish for every person of faith, to be daily made into the likeness of Christ, to be strong and ready for the challenges that face us. But how do we seek this holiness? One of the things we have to do is to strive and never stop. Gregory of Nyssa says that we must be straining constantly for the prize of the heavenly calling, always vigorously increasing our speed. After all, there's no limit to the journey towards sanctification, becoming more like Christ every day, and stopping is not safe. So this is really, this is not life as usual, and this is not a life of comfort. It's a life where you're constantly challenging yourself. Gregory of Nyssa even went further to say that stopping in this race of virtue marks the beginning of the race of evil. So first, strive and never stop. Second, we need to be tested in order to be prepared. Throughout scripture, God shaped the hearts of men and women in preparation for their service as leaders so that they would be ready to lead powerfully and faithfully. Scholars test themselves. You have to go talk to the faculty here. Talk to your professors about this process. In order to get a scholarly work published, You have to send this document out to people who are specialists in the field. You send it to a journal who sends them to specialists. And these articles then come back with all these critical comments. And so what I would always have to do after I got one of those reviews back is go find two friends, go for a three-mile walk, 
complain constantly, telling them how these reviewers didn't get it right and didn't understand what I was trying to say, set it aside for two days, and then come back and read it. And usually, the reviewers were right. So it's rarely that a manuscript, a work, gets accepted for publication on the first try. This process involves accountability to a community of scholars and standards of scholarship, as well as perseverance, that perseverance to not stop but try again. And it makes scholars work stronger and their contribution greater. So scholars grow into becoming leading scholars through this process because their work becomes known for its rigor and its rich contribution to intellectual thought brought about by this accountability and perseverance. On the personal level, we are tested. I went through a divorce when my daughters were six and nine. Recently, a friend who stayed by my side during that time lamented the trauma that I had to go through. I had to tell her that I would have not wished it any other way because I was who I was because of that experience. The trial, both metaphorical and real, shaped me profound, profoundly in terms of virtue development, although I'm sure that there are many would say, would say that I'm certainly not shaped enough yet, including my daughters. But talk about public exposure and vulnerability. Just go to trial. And believe me, it doesn't have the glamour of TV trials. And institutions that lead can expect public exposure and vulnerability. We become humbled in these times of vulnerability, leading us to be dependent on God. In my case, I could not escape structures of accountability and the total loss of control. Accountability to the legal system, which of course you cannot escape until your children are 18. Accountability to Calvin College and its standards for the faculty. Accountability to the Christian community related to upholding the institution of marriage. And accountability to my daughters, who I had a commitment to. I could not escape the necessity of living within structures of accountability even to the point of feeling like I was losing myself. So in some sense, the more responsibility you have, the greater your accountability to others. The stakes become higher, and your responsibility to others increases in this journey towards servant leadership. I believe that this is the reason that the Bible puts holiness at the center rather than categories of leadership. And it's why liturgical churches have the practice of praying for leaders every Sunday morning. So I've often thought about virtue development in relationship to leadership, where we have structures of obligation and accountability that have to be navigated, embraced, and lived within, whether it's marriage, parenthood, or difficult work situations. Aspects of our lives test us, force us to look at ourselves more closely, and through it, we learn to deal with the reality of an imperfect world and our imperfect selves within the constrained context. With my loss of control, there was incredible anxiety and fear. Losing my daughters, fear of rejection and loss of friendships, financial vulnerability. There is nothing like total loss of control to force dependence on God. I remember a two-year period of time where I constantly had praise music on in order to be in a state of prayer and remain centered in God and quell my anxiety. That total dependence on God was not only necessary in order to calm my anxious heart, but also because I had to depend on God for my soul defense. Certainly, the desire to defend decisions, 
often decisions that are complex and multifaceted and involve short-term pain and long-term hopes is one that has to be mastered as people move into deeper leadership roles. Because in the end, it is impossible to defend yourself against every voice and every individual demand. Thomas Akempis said that all of the saints pass through times of temptation and tribulation, and they use them to make progress in their spiritual life. He stated, sometimes it is good for us to have troubles and hardships, for they often call us back to our own hearts. Sometimes it is good that we put up with people speaking against us, and sometimes it is good that we be thought of as bad and flawed, even when we do good things and have good intentions. Such troubles are often aids to humility, and they protect us from pride. Indeed, we are sometimes better as seeking God when people have nothing but bad things to say about us and when they refuse to give us credit for the good things we have done. That being the case, we should so root ourselves in God that we do not need to look for comfort anywhere else. As much as I would have wished for it, I could not save my daughters from pain but had to live in the promise that God would be faithful, allowing me to allow my daughters to have their own journeys towards healing. My short-term anxiety had to be controlled through focusing on the hope that comes with God's promise. And likewise, we cannot always save our organizations, our colleagues, our students, and our alums from pain as much as we would wish we could. To be able to live with this, to understand it, find meaning in this journey, the desire to make all things whole and ease all pain, and to be unable to do it requires tremendous holiness. And I want to say that one more time. To be able to live with this to understand it, to find meaning in the journey, the desire to make all things whole and ease all pain and to be unable to do it requires tremendous holiness. So what are the characteristics of a life of leadership and holiness? It is a life centered in Christ where we risk exposure a life where we live with the joy within the reality of being constrained within structures of accountability, faced with moral dilemmas of not being able to please or care for everyone in the way that we wish, while living in that faith-filled space between what is and what shall be, depending on God completely in order to quell our fear and anxiety in order that we not be deflected from the task that God has given us. Again, my friend Scott Roden summarizes this by saying that the goal of the Christian leader must be to go to bed every night with a clear conscience and a right heart with God, that we have sought him with all our heart and we want to know and do his will. All of us, should be in the race towards this inward transformation, preparing for the roles that God has for us, a life of holiness. It is a risky race in which there is no stopping because there is no finish line in this, in this life. It is about being ambitious for God. Philippians 3 states, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Amen.